Welcome to the What You Next podcast. In this podcast, your host, Lori Ami, will interview published authors to chat about their work, journey to getting published, and their book recommendations. If you share a passion for books and are always looking for your next read, then join us. Welcome to the What You Next podcast. Today's guest is Jenna Evans Welch. Jenna writes contemporary YA novels about girls abroad. Her latest novels, Love and Olives, were set in Santorini, Greece, and it's about the myth of Atlantis. In this interview, we chat about what inspired Jenna to write YA novels, as well as her writing process. Now let's go to interview. Hi, Jenna. Welcome to the Watch Me Next podcast. Hi. Thanks so much for having me. So happy to have you here. So tell us a little bit about yourself. My name is Jenna Evans Welch. I'm a young adult writer. Um, my first came, book came out in 2016, and I have my third, which is the final one in a series, coming out November 10th. Um, So I've been in the YA world for a few years now. I really love writing girl abroad stories. I write contemporary fiction and I am a huge, huge lover of books. First and foremost. (laughs) I love this. And I can't wait to talk about girl abroad series because there's like a particular niche that you've been able to take over and actually create, you know, perfect pandemic readings for those of us who are staying at home. Oh, thank you. (laughs) Obviously, I didn't know a pandemic was coming, but I felt like, you know, I've always had this wanderlust going on in the background. So (laughs) it made sense for me. (laughs) That's awesome. So what inspired you to become a writer? Um, I can remember being seven years old and wanting to be a writer. Um, As soon as I learned how to read, I just fell hard for books. They, Mm -hmm. I mean, I just love them so much. And People will try to fight me on this, but I claim to have read more books than any child ever. (laughs) That is all I ever wanted to do. Um, And I just, I read and read and read. And I remember very clearly around 11 years old, getting to a point where I felt like I'd read all the children's literature that was in my library that was available to me. And I was so excited to read the books that were for teenagers. Mm -hmm. Um, And I am 34 now. So this was like late nineties. And I remember my mom taking me to the library and going to the teenager section. And it was this tiny little shelf. And I was so disappointed both by the size of it and also by what was on the shelf. Mm -hmm. I remember thinking just all the books were about cheerleaders and I was not very interested in cheerleaders. I wanted, you know, the fun and adventure of the heroines I'd grown up reading about, but Mm -hmm. I wanted them a little bit older and maybe with some kissing added in. Mm -hmm. Um, And I can remember telling my mom, one day I'm going to write the books that I wish were on that shelf. Um, And I carried that with me for a long time. I published my first one um, just before I turned 30. So it's, it's been a lifelong thing for me, knowing that I wanted to write and also knowing who I wanted to write for. Mm-hmm. I love it. I love that you knew we're early on you want to write YA, you know, and like just give stories that are they're more diverse. They're, they're so different, different sphere. Like I love that you write about girls abroad, you know, like just thinking about traveling and thinking about what it's what it's coming of age that happens when you're traveling to um that is an experience that's unique enough. Yeah, thank you. And I think I gravitated to that really easily because I had that experience as a teenager. Um, I grew up in Salt Lake City, Utah, um, which is a wonderful place, but I think I felt very sheltered for a long time. And then my sophomore year of high school, my family moved to Florence, Italy, which was the inspiration for my first book. Um, But I just felt my whole world just explode. It was just like, you know, this exponential growth. Um, And I think that experience, along with just the experience of being a teenager, when suddenly you know, your life is widening. You suddenly have all these options available to you. You start thinking about who you want to be, um, what kind of life you want to have. Um, I just felt like travel and being a teenager just very naturally went together for me. I love this. I love your books. <laughs> oh, thank so, you. What was your journey to get that first book published? Oh, a long one, like mm-hmm. many people. Um, also a very different one um, than most. So I have kind of a different scenario. Um, I am in a family of writers, basically. So my father has been publishing novels since I was very young. Um, he actually just published his 41st novel. So oh four one. I know. It's so <laughs> shocking. I think about that and I have like heart palpitations sometimes. Um, so I grew up watching him write. Um, and I already knew, I mean, I really feel like it had nothing to do with him, but I knew what I wanted to do deep down. And, you know, as I explained before, um, so when I was, I think I was 22, maybe 23, when I decided I was going to write my first attempt at a book 
Um, and that first draft was a very, very early draft of Love and Gelato. I called it Carolina, Carolina, and it was awful, like so awful. And I feel like sometimes people don't believe me when I talk about how bad it was. Um, it had almost no plot at all. I didn't understand how to give this book a story. I had my character, I had my setting. And it's interesting, actually, a lot of those things remained similar, but I really didn't have the story yet. Um, and I cared so much about the outcome. I just was devastated by this first attempt. I didn't know how to fix it. I knew it wasn't good. I knew what kind of book I wanted to write, but I had no idea how to write that book. And I think especially when you're starting out that your taste level and your skill levels are just completely mismatched, right? Like, especially if you're a really big reader, you have mm -hmm. probably a very high expectation of books and your first attempts are like, going to come nowhere near that. So it was just like offending my reader soul to read this terrible thing that I had written. And I was so sad. It was like, this is the one thing that I have ever truly, truly wanted to do. And then now I've tried and it's not like, oh, I need to work on it. It felt like, no, you can't do it. This is so bad. <laughs> so I tried to fix it. I couldn't even really figure out what I needed to do to fix it. I ended up just shoving it in a closet for years. Um, I actually stumbled on that upon that first manuscript um, a couple of years ago, and it makes me so happy to look at now. Um, so in the meantime, I started working with my dad as his writing assistant. So I say that I had the only novel writing apprenticeship maybe in history. Mm -hmm. um, so I would do editing for him. I would do research. He would occasionally be like, oh, write in a quick description of that. Or I'd get brave and think, oh, I don't like that line. I'm going to change it, right? I would change little mm -hmm. things here or there. Um, and all along the way for years, he kept saying to me, where's your book? Get it out of the closet. I know you can hear the music. That's what he calls it when you have just the writer mind. Um, and I finally got to a point where I was just getting mad at him. I was like, dad, like, this is just too painful. Like, please don't bring it up again. I tried so hard and I'm, I wasn't even close. And so he decided she's giving up and I'm not going to let her do that. So he actually took my terrible draft to his publisher, which is uh, Simon Schuster mm -hmm. and said, I see a lot of potential in this. It clearly does not have a plot. What do you guys think? <laughs> and they had actually made me an offer before I realized that they'd seen it. So that is a story that has not happened to anyone I know. And honestly, it created a lot of, of extra stress for me in the way that I just felt like an imposter for a long time. Um, basically the stipulation was, you know, rewrite this and we'll publish it. So I had a year and I think I wrote Love and Gelato three or four times start to finish. Um, and when I was done, I mean, I just, I just threw myself at it. I, I was like, this is my chance. I am going to give absolutely everything I have. Um, I wrote and wrote and wrote. And I remember at the end, when I turned in that final draft, I had no idea if it would lead to future books. I had no idea if it would be well-received, but I knew that this was a book that I would have loved, right? As 11 year old me would have gone crazy for this book. And that was just an incredible feeling. That's amazing. I have to tell you, as a reader for Love and Gelato in 2016, it was just like a delightful, I think it was just like one of those breath of fresh air because they were just like, it was fun. It was in Florence. It was just like, it took me away from where I was in my life and gave me, like, gave me a break. And so. Thank you. That's what, that's what I always hope for. I want a break and I want lightness. Um, and I also want it to talk about things that are important to the people who are reading it, you know, like explore important themes. But I think that fun and lightness is important. <laughs> like, I think that we need to have breaks from a lot of things that are going on in our lives. I think that it's important to infuse joy into the things that we're writing and reading. So thank you so much for saying that. I appreciate it. I love this. So you talked a little bit of brief about the writing process and the first draft and how it comes about. Now that you're writing, you have a couple of books in your, under your belt. Like, do you follow an outline? Do you see where the story leads to? How do you apply? Um, so, okay, I'm sitting in my office right now, which I've been a coffee shop writer for years and then mm -hmm. pandemic happened. I'm like, oh no, I have to write at home. Yes. I have to write at home. So I actually have really started to enjoy being at home. Um, so writers talk about themselves as being plotters or pantsers. Have you heard those terms? Yeah. Okay, so 
um, plotter, meaning you have the whole story planned out start to finish. And there's some people who just do it so beautifully. They have, you know, a hundred post-it notes outlining every step of the story. You know what each character is going to be doing, you know, how the arcs are going to happen. And like, that sounds like absolute heaven to me to sit down and know what you're going to write every day. I have tried to do that so many times and it has never worked for me ever, <laughs> ever. So I think I am a pantser, meaning I fly by the seat of my pants who wishes mm -hmm. desperately they were a plotter. Um, I, I did spend a lot of time learning about plot, um, especially after writing my second novel where I felt like it's got to be easier than this. <laughs> There's got to be an easier way. Um, I studied plot for a long time. I actually watched a lot of movies because movies follow elements of plot beautifully. Um, mm -hmm. We don't realize how for uh, formulaic isn't quite the right word, but they are truly following a mm -hmm. formula. I mean, you can break down movies like at the 10% mark, this will happen at the 25% mark. And just understanding those elements, I think gave me a lot more confidence. Mm -hmm. So now what I do, um, I found that it's a waste of time for me to try to plan out the horse, whole story start to finish. So maybe I'll spend a couple of weeks on like a synopsis, right? Like just kind of a general overview of the story, where I think it's going to go, how I think the characters are going to behave. Um, but I do find that once I sit down, no matter how much that synopsis makes sense to me, once I sit down, something different almost always comes out. It feels like it uses two different parts of my brain. So I try to get the main points in there, mm -hmm. at least so I feel like I have some stepping stones. I know what I'm going towards. And then if they change, that's okay. And I don't feel like I wasted, you know, six months of my life. <laughs> it's totally fine. Well, you know, you meet the characters and it chances are the characters are going to surprise you taking different actions and you're like, well, I don't know what's going. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's exactly how it feels. Like sometimes I'm like, just do what I say, right? Or I'll, yeah. I'll like parenting my children all day. I'm like, no one listens to me. My characters don't. My kids aren't like, no one is listening to me. But, uh, you know, you want the characters to come to you in a way that is more natural. Mm -hmm. So if you've written something down and it doesn't work, if it feels lifeless, it makes the most sense to follow what that character would actually do. I love this. So let's talk about writing, writing novels. You know, you mentioned your passion, you mentioned your, um, just knowing early on that, that this is where you want to go. Like, what do you love about it? Other than, you know, it just gives you a coming of age story. There's, freedom just allowing you to explore different topics different themes yeah. that's such a good question um you know I do think that this time period in life is really important and I think that a lot of adults forget that you know relationships we had when we were young or experiences we had when we were young they're a big deal right mm -hmm. <laughs> like those that first boyfriend or girlfriend or you know first kiss or first trip you went on or first job, those are things that shape you and that you likely will look back on for a long time. Um, so I think it's important to honor that time period in your life while also knowing it in no way has to define you, thank goodness. Mm -hmm. um, so I love it for that. I also really, really love that YA is so focused on voice. I think that's the thing that is really important when writing YA is that we need to really feel and understand your character. We want someone that we will relate to. Mm -hmm. I get that a lot in, in fiction written for adults as well, but I think it's absolutely essential to teen literature. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that teens especially are like, if your story didn't grip me, forget it, right? <laughs> so it's really important to make sure that they are enjoying it and having fun and want to turn the page. So mm -hmm. yeah, I just, I love teen literature. And I often say that you know, I'm glad that I grew up when I did, because if I had all of these incredible books available to me, I don't think I would have actually experienced my youth. I would have just been in my bedroom reading and reading. <laughs> yes, I know. Like there's like an explosion. I know that's been explosion has been going on for the past 20 years, but I feel like this, especially now where there's like so much diversity, there's so many voices, there's so many, so many good stuff. You know? Yes, yeah, so needed. And it's so, so great. I'm so happy to be a part of it. Yeah, so let's start with Love and Olives. What was the source of inspiration? So Love and Olives, so this is my third book in the Love Anne series. And I knew it was going to be another girl abroad story. 
um, at this point, I knew whatever location I choose, I'm going to spend a mental year there at least. Mm -hmm. um, it, one of the fun things about writing in these locations is uh, I feel like I've been there, right? Like Greece, I feel like I was just there and it's been, oh man, like a year and a half since I actually went to visit the island. Um, so I decided I'm going to do something fun. Why don't I just pick a place that I'm interested in and I'll figure out a story there. Mm -hmm. So I just did this Google search and I found this little bookstore on this tiny Greek Island. And it just, I just felt my heart fluttering. I was like, Oh, that's it. There's mm -hmm. going to be a story there. So I booked a flight there and went with my husband, which was fun. We stayed in a cave house. I jumped off cliffs. We went to the bookstore three times a day. We were about petting stray dogs and eating all the delicious Greek food and watching sunsets. Like it was just a wonderful, wonderful trip. Um, and then I came home and I wrote a story about a bookstore and it was a difficult book to write and something about it was not right. And I ended up starting over completely. Oh my gosh. I know. So I actually wrote this book twice. I mean, like start to finish twice. Um, so it was very difficult to decide to start over from scratch. Like I was so difficult to live with that summer. I'm sure that summer when I was trying to decide, do I try to rework this or is it all wrong? And I think I knew, I mean, I did know that it was all wrong, that I needed to try something different. Um, and as soon as I really committed and made that decision, I realized that I'd been having these images coming to me for a couple of weeks. And there were three of them. Um, one was a list of very ordinary things that, uh, mm -hmm. that, a uh, sorry, I'm stumbling over words, a list of things that a father had left behind, just very everyday items. Um, and then there was a map, the lost city of Atlantis and, um, a girl diving into the ocean, looking for something and having the ocean go black. Um, so I'd had these like ideas, like circulating in my mind. And as soon as I really turned my attention on them, I was the story just kind of bubbled up. It was pretty incredible. I actually wrote it very quickly. It's much longer than my other books, like quite a bit longer. The finished book is 500 pages, like right on the dot, which is mm -hmm. long, <laughs> long for me. Um, so it's funny because the first book I was writing about this bookstore and the bookstore was in both, is, a, is a part of the finished book as well. Mm -hmm. But I was writing about this bookstore called Atlantis Books. Um, but there was nothing about the lost city of Atlantis. Um, and the second book is all about the lost city of Atlantis. So it's about our main character, Liv, who has her life all together, except she has the secret that her father has been looking for the lost city of Atlantis for a long time. She hasn't seen him since she was eight years old. And then he resurfaces and they're working on a project about the lost city of Atlantis together. Um, and I fell really hard for Atlantis. I'm not someone who's ever been very interested in myths or sci-fi or, I don't know, conspiracy theories of any sort. And I was just obsessed. I couldn't think about anything else for weeks and weeks. Um, this book was really, really special to me and really fun to write. It was really special to read for me because it was just like, I think it took me to a different world and it got me thinking about Greece. It got me thinking about philosophy. It got me thinking about, you know, lost cities, explorers, and just even a relation with the father daughter, you know, how they're strange and how they rebuild that as a strange man, you know. Thank you. I, I think that family relationships are my most, um, is the, is the topic I'm most interested in writing about. Mm -hmm. I think our relationships with each other are the most fascinating thing we have going on, honestly. <laughs> yeah, I really love it. I really love, I just, I, I'm excited for the audiobook, like every word, so I can actually relive it again. Oh, like, yay, thank like, you. It's one of those things I'm like, oh my God, it's like, because it was like so immersive. And I, you know, I, I love about that it's immersive in this world that is just like, you're in Santorini, you're exploring and you're exploring within this lens of Atlantis. Like it's mm. unique enough that you don't, you, it's not just a travel bug. It's more like, let's think about it from this place. I wonder, I remember many years ago. Like the historical this, aspect, which yeah. I guess I didn't really explain it earlier. So the Atlantis tie-in with this Greek island is, is basically that a lot of people believe that the basis of the myth of Atlantis comes from Santorini because there was 
this very advanced civilization that was there. There was this huge volcano, ex volcanic explosion, and this whole civilization got wiped out. So there's a lot of people who theorize that that's actually where the lost city of Atlantis came from. And everything's named Atlantis there, which is funny. <laughs> and I was just like, you know, on my trip there, I was like, oh, weird, everything's Atlantis. And like, <laughs> and then I got home, I was like, I didn't go see, like, I didn't see the things I should have seen. I didn't know I was going to be writing about Atlantis. I thought I was just writing about a bookstore. So I've got to go back. You gotta go back now and to I know. different stuff. So, what was the research process like now, knowing that you're gonna write that you end up writing a book about Atlantis? Yeah. So I went there first of all, right? Um, I definitely am someone who has to go someplace to feel like they can do it justice. I think there are a lot of writers who figure out how to write about places without visiting, and I feel like I have to like, especially because I care about care so much about creating a like an experience for a reader where you feel like you're there. Like I really truly want to transport someone to on vacation, like on a vacation, basically. Mm -hmm. I want to give you like a break from everyday life. Um, and I don't feel like I can do that without like, I don't know, this will sound cheesy, but like spelling the island and feeling the air and mm -hmm. tasting the food, right? Like, I feel like I have to do those things. So on my trips, like, <laughs> like when I did research for Love and Luck, my second book, which is a road trip set in Ireland, so my best friend came with me and she, she was like the photographer and the driver and she handled all the like day-to-day -day stuff. And I basically have like a hundred photos of me, like hunched over a notebook. Like she would, I would just like follow behind her, like frantically writing down everything I was experiencing. So I did that in Santorini as well. I had my notebooks of just me scribbling down everything I was feeling, what I thought a character would notice, what you would need to tell someone in order for them to, to feel like they were on this island. Um, and then once I realized I was writing about Atlantis, I just like went nuts. And usually it comes down to a lot of books. Like the project I'm working on right now, I have like 76 books out from the library right now. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Which I didn't realize how crazy that is. And then I posted it online and like, guess how many books I have out right now? And people were like, <laughs> well, 19. And I was like, oh, <laughs> okay. That's actually a lot. Um, so I usually like get a lot of books and then just see what draws my attention and then kind of dive into those topics more. Um, but with Atlantis, I ended up watching a lot of documentaries, mm -hmm. which was really helpful. And I was so interested, especially in the people who have dedicated their lives to looking for this lost island. Because there are people who are, I mean, honestly, that have been like ridiculed for this idea and this belief they have that the city truly exists and they have just held fast in it. I think that is so interesting and so touching honestly um so I watched a bunch of documentaries I read books I read Plato um I actually I sourced all of it I, I have like a source list in the back of Love and Olives because so many of the sources were like so interesting I just feel like people should look them up if they're at all interested um there was like the six minute um just this little video on YouTube that I probably watched over a hundred times it was so informative and helpful to me so that that one's in there but yeah, if anyone is interested in learning more about Atlantis, I think I found all the best, the best things to watch. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sure. <laughs> so what are you working next? So I'm working on my first book outside of the love and world. Um, it was kind of this moment of, okay, am I going to write another love and, and I'm getting all these messages like write another love and, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, it was, I, I, I just kept thinking, is it time for me to try something different? Should I keep going with this? And then pandemic happened. And I was like, you know what? I can't go anywhere right now. Mm -hmm. um, so I felt like the decision was kind of made for me in a way. And it felt honestly like a relief. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm working on a contemporary YA that as of right now is a standalone. I didn't think Love and Gelato would be part of a series, but who knows? Um, I can't talk a lot about it, but it is set in the United States. Um, I, the, the setting is still very intriguing to me and will still will be a big part of this book. Mm -hmm. um, but it's about several women in a family and it's kind of witchy, meaning I'm doing all this like witchy research. Like I have like, I should just turn my camera around. I have like tarot cards and crystals and all sorts of stuff all over my office. So like I've just been interested in that kind of stuff this year and I feel like you should just dive into whatever you're interested in because that will you know that will just make your writing better yeah so I'm, I'm just diving right in we're going really witchy over here oh my gosh I am so excited <laughs> thank you 
And someone who grew up in like a lot of witchy stuff, like it's like just come yet, yeah, you know. Perfect. Do you I think you will like this? Yeah, like if it sparks joy, just do it, you know. Mm-hmm. But yeah, like if you I have found that if I'm not having fun writing it, like no one's gonna have any fun reading it. Anything yeah. I've thought through, I've ended up throwing out because it just doesn't have the spark. Yeah. So, oh my gosh, this is so exciting. So, all right. So now let's go to a round of book recommendations. This is an opportunity to share with the audience what they should read next. What is your favorite genre? Oh man, I read a lot of different things. Um, YA, obviously I read a ton of. Um, so right now I'm reading two books that I'm loving. I'm usually reading multiple books at a time. Mm-hmm. So I just grabbed what I had on my like next to my bed. So you should see me in a crown by Leah Johnson. Have you read this one yet? I have it on my TBR and okay. I really need to. <laughs> I've heard so many amazing things about it. I'm just like a couple chapters in and I'm enjoying it so much. This is a great book for voice. Yes. <laughs> that we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Um, I'm also reading a book called Only Mostly Devastated. Mm. And the author's name is Sophie Gonzalez. I think it's a like fairly new release. Um, so it's like a retelling of Greece, the musical, really? it's, two, it's two boys and it's really, really funny. Like I'm like laughing out loud and I feel like I'm a hard sell for funny. I enjoy funny books, but very rarely do they make me laugh out loud. And this one is making me laugh out loud. So there's two fun YA books that I'm really enjoying. Well, you had me at Greece retelling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really, it's really charming. It's I'm enjoying it. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. So tell us where you can find you online. So I am mostly on Instagram. I spend way too much time there. So I'm just under Jenna Evans Welch. Awesome. Thank you, Jenna, for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. This is fun. If you enjoyed this podcast, feel free to share with friends, subscribe, rate, and review the show. This is the easiest way to support this podcast. Once you connect with fellow women's readers and make new friends, get weekly book recommendations, attend monthly meetups, then join our Patreon community. You can join at whatreadnextblog.com slash Patreon. Romance lovers, check out Queen Bee Reads Etsy shop for cute and comfortable bookish apparel. The shop also features social justice apparel and fun items from some of your favorite TV shows like The Shits, Greeks, and The Office. Use code whatread 10 to save. Visit whatreadnextblog.com slash Queen Bee Reads. What to Read Next podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Discover new podcasts to love on frolic.media slash podcast. Thank you so much for listening and have a great day.